The contemplative stream, very simply, is loving attention to God. Nothing is more needed on the contemporary scene. Distraction is a primary spiritual problem in our day. We are so consumed with muchness and manyness. Our lives are taken over by noise, hurry, and crowds, by climb, push, and shove. Let me say it again. Distraction is the primary spiritual problem of our day. Can I, for just a moment, make this personal? I desperately need this life of loving attention to God. Every single day, I'm attacked by the temptation to focus all of my energies on accomplishing, on producing, on doing, doing, doing. At the end of the day, I'm tempted to evaluate my success solely in terms of efficiency, of assignments done, of checklists completed, of tasks accomplished. This feeling of defining our very existence by our doing is the very air we breathe. It's our cultural oxygen tank. So I need to hear this call to loving attention to God. You need it. We all need it. The contemplative stream can lead us into the divine rest that will overcome the modern pandemic of distraction. In each of these sessions, I'm planning to share with you a couple of stories of people who stand as exemplary models of the particular stream we're looking at. And I'm choosing people that I didn't write about in the book Streams of Living Water, just to add some variety to our study. Each time I'll be using a biblical person and someone from Christian history. And I'm doing this because we really do learn best by imitation. In fact, it's the only way we learn. Besides, these people are endlessly interesting and great fun. The two people I want us to learn from for the contemplative stream are Hannah in the Bible and Juan de la Cruz, or as we would say, St. John of the Cross. You may remember the story of Hannah. It's really a lovely story. In Jewish tradition, Hannah is considered the originator of contemplative prayer. Most of Jewish prayer is liturgical in character. But here you have somebody praying in complete silence, with her lips moving, but no words coming from her mouth. But I'm running ahead of the story. Hannah had no child, and having no child was a great source of shame to her, and grief, and anxiety, and anger even. Silly, you say. Well, silly things hurt, and hurt deeply. As was the custom of that day, Hannah's husband, Elkanah, took a second wife in order to have an heir. Uh, and this second wife had baby after baby, all of which only increased Hannah's misery. And to add insult to injury, this second wife was very proud of her baby-producing ability and heckled Hannah endlessly. And Hannah took it all pretty hard. The Bible says that she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, is as understanding as I suppose he could be in that culture. He says to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Now that question, why is your heart sad, contains more than meets the eye. Literally it means, why is your heart bad? That is, Hannah's heart was starting to be resentful toward God. Here she was, barren in a culture that prizes fertility. And now a second woman has come along and stolen the limelight. Faithfully, Hannah has gone to Shiloh every year and worshipped and prayed. But it seems like the doors of heaven are slammed shut on her requests. Out of sympathy, Elkanah gives her a double portion to sacrifice to the Lord during their annual pilgrimage. But it doesn't diminish her grief. And now here she is going up to Shiloh with a bad heart, outwardly worshiping and praying, but inwardly angry and resentful. Well, on one of the pilgrimages to Shiloh, Hannah's misery peaks. 
She presents herself to the Lord, says the Bible. She's distressed and she prays to the Lord and she weeps bitterly. All decorum is thrown to the wind. The dam of grief that she's carried in her heart all of these years bursts with a great torrent of prayer. But it is inward prayer, silent prayer. Her lips are moving, but no audible words are coming out. And Eli, the priest, great spiritual giant that he was, decided she was drunk. And so he rebukes her severely. Now just think of how you would feel. You're at the place of worship faithfully every year, year after year. And this year your heart breaks. Tears stream down your cheeks. You're pouring your heart out to God. And the religious leader, the authority in charge of all this ritual stuff, accuses you of being drunk. What would you think at that point? All the anger, all the resentment, all the grief and disappointment you would think it would burst out against Eli, but no. Hannah replies very simply, No, my Lord, I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. To his credit, Eli realizes that he's in the presence of a great soul, of someone who knows God in a way that he has never known God. And so he says very simply, God will give you the desires of your heart. And as you know, Hannah does indeed become pregnant and delivers to the world the boy Samuel. Now can I freeze frame for just a moment that prayer of Hannah at Shiloh? A unique prayer, a personal prayer, a heartfelt prayer, a gut-wrenching prayer, a passionate prayer. Indeed, a prayer that changed the history of the nation of Israel. This is what we classically speak of as the prayer of the heart, and it is the fountainhead of all contemplative prayer. Oh, may we learn to enter the prayer of the heart more fully, more passionately, more simply, more deeply. Listen to a few words of Hannah's canical which flows out of the experience and has echoed down through the centuries and as later reflected in Mary's canticle. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. A lovely story. But now I'm eager to tell you about Juan de la Cruz, known to us today as St. John of the Cross. I liked him immediately when I learned how short he was. Four foot, 11 inches. Just the right height. Actually, when Teresa of Avila first met him, she told her nuns, I've met half a friar. <laughs> I mean, you just have to love a guy like that. I also like the fact that John was such a fun-loving person, a great storyteller, an engaging conversationalist. On horseback, he would regale everyone with his lively stories. John loved picnics. He would arrange weekend jaunts for his friars. Amazing. And I love the way that John was able to lift the burden of anxiety from people. Folks would come to him for confession filled with guilt and oppressive religiosity. And John would tenderly bring them into the love and care and acceptance of God. He was the most popular confessor around. <laughs> it was said that John was able to cure people of the illness of scrupulosity. So I find John of the Cross immensely appealing and interesting. Let me anchor him for you historically and geographically. He lived in Spain, 16th century, time known as the golden age of Spain. He was the youngest of three boys. He grew up in grinding poverty, his father dying when he was three years old, and his older brother dying, we think, from malnutrition. Early on, he showed a flair for learning, study, Latin, rhetoric, and then the classics. 
This was when he began to write his poetry. When he was 21, he entered the Carmelite order and they sent him off to the University of Salamanca for studies in philosophy and theology and he excelled. He had a heart for the contemplative life and when he met Teresa of Avila, an inner and outer revolution began. Teresa was a reformer in the Carmelite order and we'll learn more about her when we come to the holiness stream. When John and Teresa met, he was 25 years old. She was 52 and was looking for a leader who could bring her renewal efforts to the male side of the order. And immediately she saw in John a giant of a soul. And so she enlisted him in her work of renewal. Feverish work. They were both skilled organizers and planners and doers. At the same time, they were both practicing uh, uh, sp the spiritual life at a deep level. They were also both exceedingly popular. But of course, popularity has its drawbacks. The conservatives in the order resented these new reforms and innovations, and they began opposing John and instigating whispering campaigns about him. Unfortunately, he was arrested by his own order and imprisoned in Toledo, imprisoned for nine months in a room 10 feet by six feet. This time of imprisonment was a dark night for John and it deeply framed his understanding and experience of prayer. He composed poems during this detention, but since he had no pen or paper, he compo composed them solely in his head, committing them to memory. It is these poems, 26 in all, that frame the heart of the writing of John of the Cross. The books of his that we have, The Dark Night of the Soul, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, The Spiritual Canticle, and The Living Flame of Love are all commentaries on these poems. John of the Cross is best known for the phrase, The Dark Night of the Soul. This is really the heart of his work, and it centers on his teaching on detachment, nada in Spanish. The idea uh, being that nothing is important except for God. We are stripped of every detachment or entanglement in order to be utterly simple and naked before God. We are not even to cling to mystical experiences of one kind or another, nada. Because his poetry, contemplative poetry at its best, is so central to all of John of the Cross, I thought I would like to read a little bit of it for you. Now, I'm well aware that poetry is hard to grasp in a setting like this. And I know that poetry is tough when we're receiving it through translation. But still, it's lovely. Listen. One dark night fired with love's urgent longings. Ah, the sheer grace. I went out unseen, my house being now all stilled. Now, his reference to the house being still is a reference to the senses, the silencing of what the old writers called creaturely activity, just humanly initiated activity. In darkness and secure, by the secret ladder, disguised, ah, the sheer grace, in darkness and concealment, my house be now all stilled. On that glad night in secret, for no one saw me, nor did I look at anything with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart. This guided me more surely than the light of noon to where he waited for me, him whom I knew so well in a place where no one appeared. Here's another piece. O oh, guiding night. Now he's speaking about the silencing of the senses again. The night is all of the senses being stilled. O oh, guiding night, O oh, night more lovely than the dawn. O oh, night that has united the lover with his beloved transforming the beloved in her lover. So this, this sense of darkness, this sense of entering 
the silence with God. You see, nada, nothing but God. O living flame of love that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center, since now you are not oppressive, now consummate, if it be your will, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. O sweet cautery, O delightful wound. This idea of being wounded by God, it's where we get the notion of the wounded stag, actually. Encountering John of the Cross's poetic record of his prayer experience is humbling. I mean, I'm so irregular. I'm so impatient, so distracted, so disconnected. John's prayer experience feels so centered, so anchored, so transforming, so thrilling, even hair-raising. It shows me that I have a lot to learn and a long way to go. Let me share with you my very first attempt at contemplative prayer. I, I went to a retreat center. And I was exhausted. First thing I did was I fell asleep. <laughs> and then when I got up, I tried to read a book, uh, tried to read the Bible. And I kept asking myself, why am I not praying? And I kept reading. I started with 1 Samuel. Of course, after 1 Samuel comes 2 Samuel. And I kept going. Uh, the three sisters that were at this little retreat center invited me to their morning prayers the next day. And so I went, and when I got there, the first thing they said was, now we will be attentive in the presence of the Lord. And I was stuck. And for 20 minutes, complete silence. It was as if a dam broke inside of me. And afterwards, I went out for a little jog, and this was this wonderful experience of prayer for every house I went by, and, and then back to a little garden at that retreat center. And just for a couple of hours, that sense of wonder, that sense of nada, that sense of openness, that sense of sinking down into the light of Jesus Christ until I could become comfortable in that posture. You see, nothing is more important than learning this mute language which says so much. What could be more necessary in our world of action and distraction? What could be more essential than a richer, fuller, deeper practice of the presence of God? It's like coming home, home to where we belong, home to that for which we are created, home to intimacy, home to wholeness, home to stillness and love and acceptance. I would like us to close this session with a little experience of contemplative prayer. John of the Cross and the Carmelites were well known for a way of prayer called recollection or recollection, being brought to a place where we are present where we are, of being centered and still, of loving attention to God. And so I want us to enter into just a brief experience of recollection. Let's begin by attention to those wonderful words of Frederick W. Faber, only to sit and think of God. Oh, what a joy it is to think the thought, to breathe the name. Earth has no higher bliss. Let's pray. Only to sit and think of God. Oh, what a joy it is to think the thought, to breathe the name. Earth has no higher bliss. And now let's give attention to those wonderful words of the psalmist. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised.
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Teach us, O Lord, your greatness. Amen. Dallas, can you help us learn some ways that you've experienced loving attention to God? Silence is key mm -hmm. to this. And I didn't know what I was doing when I was led into it, but because I wanted to be able to pray, mm. I went alone. Mm. And I spent a lot of time in silence and by accident began to realize the effect of silence on centering me mm. on God. Yeah. Uh, silence, uh, of course, solitude is involved in this because that's about the only way you can get silence. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but if you establish silence in your heart, then you have a space mm. in which you can, by practice, come to keep God on the horizon of your yeah. consciousness. Now, why is that so important? It's because of all the things that are already hooked into us. Mm. And the only way we can release those is by practicing solitude and silence until we stop jerking. <laughs> <laughs> And then we began to rest in our vision of God yeah. and waiting on Him. We establish God before our mind mm. by changing the habits that dominate our lives. Mm. And then what that does for us, it brings love, joy, and peace because in the presence of God, that's what you gain. Mm. Love, joy, and peace. Mm. You, you know, for example, that everything is well. Yeah. And now, St. John of the Cross used this concept of nada, mm -hmm. nothing between myself and God. That's right. Um, can you give us some sense of, or recommendations of how followers of Jesus could actually have nada between themselves and God? Well, St. John and others have found often that it was times of enforced solitude and yeah, silence. Right that has brought them to this place. But we mm -hmm. don't have to have someone put us in jail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to unhook ourselves from the things that preoccupy us. Mm -hmm. One of the things, one of the terms that is often used by people in this area is centering prayer. Mm -hmm. And to center means to, to take yourself off of all of the things that are around you. And that's the mm -hmm. nada. Mm -hmm. Now you do that by Si solitude and silence, but the outcome is to center you on God mm. so that you know the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mm. I shall not, I'll lack nothing. Yeah, That's the right. nada. Right. It's right. the sufficiency of God. Yeah. That's the positive side of the nada. Mm. The person who takes the nada nearly as, merely as a negation and tries to do that will probably fail. fail at it. But yeah. you can use disciplines like solitude and silence to put you in a position where you realize the sufficiency of God to the soul. Hmm. And then you have established a center yeah. where you can live. Yeah.